So, hey, everybody. My name is Cole Baker. Uh, I'm a legal intern with the IIPSJ, and today I get the pleasure of speaking with Lita Rosaria Richardson. Uh, Lita runs Wise Girl Entertainment Counseling, uh, where she provides legal advice and advocacy for creators uh, relating to IP and uh, entertainment issues. Early on in her career, Lita founded um, and was the VP of Business and Legal Affairs for University Music Group, which produced multi-platinum artists such as Drew Hill, uh, Cisco, and MYA. Lita has represented George Clinton, Missy Elliott, members of Parliament Funkadelic, African Bombada, and Soul Sonic Force, to name just a few. Lita is also an uh, adjunct professor at the University of the District of Columbia's Department of Mass Media, Visual and Performing Arts. Uh, we're honored to hear from you today, Lita, and are so grateful that you took the time. Sure, thank you, thank you. Um, I am, I also um, adjunct at American University's COGOD School of um, Business too, just informationally. Um, okay, great, great to be here, Cole. Great. Um, so yeah, my first question, uh, take you back. Uh, so first, why did you choose Howard for your undergraduate education and specifically what pulled you to study communications and computer science? So um, uh, it's funny, I, um, my mother was a counselor <clears throat> at a private school in, in Boston. Uh, that's where I'm from originally. Um, and she took a group of students um, who were interested in the sciences and medicine and dentistry in particular, uh, like junior high school kids to Washington DC to visit Howard University. And I have two sisters and she took my sisters and I along with her on that trip. And that was my first introduction to Howard University. Um, it wasn't until years later that I learned that my mother actually had um, wanted to go to Howard University when she was young, when she was graduating from high school, she went to girls high school in Boston, but the counselors told her that she wasn't college material. So she ended up going to secretarial school. Um, my mother eventually graduated with her master's degree from um, uh, Cambridge College up in Massachusetts. Um, and the same year that I actually graduated from high school and I decided that I wanted to go to Howard and I applied to Howard and got accepted, but it was because of that trip that I took with my mother. And at that time, I thought I wanted to be a dentist when I was younger. Um, but by the time I graduated from high school, I realized that journalism was probably more my forte and something that I was good at. And my mother always said I was a great communicator. So she encouraged me in that way. And I had a column in a local community newspaper as a high school student where I would interview other high school kids about what their future college and other career aspirations were. Um, and so I, I started Howard with um, thinking that I would be a journalism major. Um, and I chose computer science because um, things were changing then. So that was 1979. Um, I remember the computer that we used in the School of Engineering was the size of a whole room, like it was a gigantic computer and we had punch cards and we had to learn cobalt computer languages and, and things like that from back then. And um, it was, I was just interested in it um, because it was the new technology. It was seemed to be the way things were going. And it's funny how ultimately um, decisions that you make when you look back on your career, kind of all these pieces of a puzzle kind of fit together um, to help you ultimately reach, you know, wherever your career, um, wherever your career takes you. So um, I studied computer science. I, I switched my major from journalism to um, uh, uh, broadcast journalism. Um, broadcast management, I mean, because the school was encouraging students to get into the broadcasting side of journalism at that time. And my my dream was to be a foreign correspondent. Like, that's what I thought my life would be. I would be, you know, a CNN correspondent in Egypt or, you know, Israel or you know, South Africa, wherever. And that's what I wanted to do. But when I got to Howard, I got recruited to the debate team. And I was one of the only females on the debate team. And um, uh, all of the guys on the debate team were going to law school. So 
it kind of really, because I was competing with them, I decided to go to law school too. I never had any, no one in my family is a lawyer. I never had any real intention of being a lawyer. Um, my parents always encouraged us for college, but not really beyond that in terms of professional school. So, um, and while I was at Howard um, in my senior year of undergrad, Kamala Harris started Howard undergrad and I recruited just as I was recruited to the debate team, I recruited her to the Howard debate team. So, um, and obviously she knew though that she wanted to be a lawyer. Um, but I was just kind of figuring that out probably my third and fourth year of undergrad, my my um, junior and senior year. Awesome. Yeah, that's some really interesting stuff in there. Um, yeah, so I guess kind of following there, you're kind of thinking about what you want to do. Um, you graduate from law school and you end up on Wall Street initially. Um mm -hmm. So what, can you maybe talk a little bit about your work on Wall Street for the SEC, sure. how you got there, and then maybe how eventually mm -hmm. you got your way into entertainment law? Right. So I got into, and when I was at, at Howard Law School, so I applied to Howard Law School. Um, the uh, coming out, so when I decided I wanted to go to law school, I applied to, um, I, I had good grades in undergrad and I was in student government. I was the president of the student council for the School of Communications and the chairman of the Houston Policy Board. I was on the debate team. I had a lot of other things going on. I had a trustee scholarship. And I applied to Harvard um, and Columbia and some other schools thinking, of course, I would get in. Well, Harvard rejected me. It seemed like as soon as they got my letter, they rejected me <laughs> and put a big pin in my balloon. And then... Oh. Um, <laughs> Columbia and Georgetown, and I forget where else, waitlisted me. Mm -hmm. And Howard accepted me immediately. So I said, okay, um, God is obviously giving me a message. The universe is giving me a message that I need to go to Howard Law School. So right. I just accepted that and decided not to, not to further consider the waitlisted schools. And I went to Howard. So I was fortunate to graduate in the top of my class. Um, but while I was at Howard, I got um, I was doing well in school and I got um, uh, summer associate positions with um, a major law firm in Boston um, uh, called Gaston Snow and Eli Bartlett name later changed to Gaston Snow and unfortunately it's now defunct. Um, but um, they went through a reorganization. A lot of law firms in the 80s brought in business managers to kind of make their practices more business oriented. And it seems that the business managers kind of managed Gaston Snow right out of business. So that's kind yeah. of what happened to them. It was a thing that was going on in that time period. Um, and that's also the time period where salaries for big law firms kind of skyrocketed. Um, but I also had an internship at the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission in the Student Observer Program. Hmm. So um, a, uh, a gentleman named Jim Marcelino, an attorney in Boston, came to recruit at Howard from Gaston Snow. And um, I was from Boston, of course. And so he, he basically um, offered me a job um, there for the summer program and served very much as a mentor to me um, through that process. And I'm always very grateful to him for that. Um, and so I, um, I, and I realized, um, you know, I was thinking I'd be a litigator after coming out of debate, right. but when I went to Gaston Snow and they put me in a rotation program and I worked in the corporate department, I realized that um, this was, finally some interesting understanding for me of what was going on on the stock in the stock market on the stock pages the ticker tapes and all the stuff that was going on around me that I had no idea what it all meant and so it all kind of came into focus for me when I was in this rotation and I said that's what I want I want to do corporate law I want to do you know so I worked in uh did some stuff with public offerings as well as private placements and other types of investment type things and I was like this is what I want to do so when I got out of school I took an offer from Gaston Snow and in between the time that I accepted so I accepted my job for I think it was about $35,000 a year was the salary and in between the time that I accepted the job after I sat for the bar and showed up at my desk at work, my salary had increased to fifty thousand dollars. Wow! I had done nothing, Almost. and then so I get to there and I'm there for approximately a year, but I'm constantly getting phone calls 
um, from headhunters who are saying they can get me a job in the New York firms and they pay $100,000 a year. So I took some interviews. I went up to New York. I interviewed at some big firms there at Sherman and Sterling and Cravath, Swain and Moore and some of the other big ones, all, all the big firms. And Sherman and Sterling actually made an offer to me on the spot. They wow. didn't even want a second interview. They offered me the job. And so I took the job there and I gave my resignation, which was kind of sad because what I didn't realize that I was leaving at that time was the mentorship of Jim Marcelino because I didn't have that at Sherman and Sterling, mm -hmm. right? But I went up to Sherman and Sterling and it was the Michael Milken hostile takeover time. Mm -hmm. And the day that I started work was Black Monday, October 17th, <laughs> 1987, and the stock market crashed. Oh my goodness. <laughs> And, and my salary jumped from like 50,000 to 100,000 with a bonus of like, I forget, 20, 30, $40,000 as well. And so I'm sitting in New York with all this money, more money than I've ever had in my life and nothing to do because there's no work because the stock market crashed. <laughs> and they stopped hiring right after me. So they put me in this big, Sherman and Sterling had just finished um, the C-Corp Center in Midtown had just been finished being built and we're in the building across the street. The building was just built. And so we had brand new offices. So I'm in a brand new office overlooking New York city and there's no work to do because the market <laughs> crashed. Well, that changed shortly. And I worked on a lot of um, different um, types of mergers and acquisitions, hostile takeovers, I worked on a junk bond deal for Ann Taylor Corporation, which at that time it was like, dream was just a shop at Ann Taylor. And here I was, you know, working on a public offering for Ann Taylor, for Penn's Oil Corporation, for, I did a, a asset purchase, Carnival Cruise Lines bought Holland America Lines, an asset purchase, and I got to work on that. And I worked for a lot of other big clients and got some really excellent experience. Um, and, and, um, my background in corporate law, and, and most of what Sherman and Sterling did, by the way, um, was to um, represent um, dealers, um, investment banking firms, broker dealers in, in different types of transactions, public offerings or private placements or whatever it was. So our clients were either mainly Citibank, Merrill Lynch and Wasserstein and Brothers and, you know, entities like that, that we were working for. Um, so um, I worked a lot of late nights, worked on, you know, hostile takeover bids and all of that good stuff. And that training is really, um, and the knowledge of contracts that I got from that experience is what really ended up helping me as I ultimately transitioned into being an intellectual property lawyer. Right, yeah. No, that's that's crazy about coming to work your first day is Black Monday. That's, that's right. Seems like a horror story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there were homeless people all on the streets in New York. Ed Koch was the mayor at the time. Um, so lots of lots of things were going on. And um, John Kennedy Jr. was in New York at that time because he had just graduated from law school either the same year or the oh. year after I did uh, or before, just, you know, in that same time period. And he was working in the in the district attorney's office and my girlfriend was working over there and she's like, Lita, just come over here and look at him. You just got to come see him. <laughs> of course, I went over there for lunch. I was like, okay, I'll come lunch one day and I did go over there just to get a glimpse um so that was you know it was a it was an interesting time then and Dave Dinkins um ran for mayor the first black mayor of New York City and I helped on his campaign back then so there was a lot going on um in New York at that time Donald Trump was a big story at that yeah. time too mm-hmm Running his mouth, I would assume. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So, so what you kind of touched on it a little bit, um, mm -hmm. just your work, kind of with with those transactions, helping you with contracts later on. But um, mm -hmm. what would you say? What skills have factored uh, personally mm -hmm. into your success uh, up to this point? Um. So, um, I certainly think 
um, the skills that I got um, when I worked on Wall Street for Sherman and Sterling and for Gaston Snow were um, are, are very critical in terms of um, helping me really understand the relationship between finance and law. Mm -hmm. um, so I was often working with MBAs um, in when I was on Wall Street, and, you know, they were pricing deals and it's all about the money, right? So eventually when I, um, so the, the reason, the way I got into intellectual property law is that my roommate from Howard undergrad <clears throat> was um, contacted me while I was at Sherman and Sterling and told me she was offered a contract, um, a recording contract from a production company out of Baltimore and she needed a lawyer. And I knew that Sherman and Sterling was not gonna take her on as a client here. She's just one you know, little individual with a little contract from Baltimore. Um, so I contacted a colleague of mine, Kervin Sims, who um, did entertainment law, who was in New York and went over to meet with him. And so I, I basically moonlighted my job and worked with Kervin to negotiate Crystal's contract. And then Crystal's, my roommate is Crystal Waters. And her first song came out and it was, went platinum. Uh, and a lot of people know the song, la da dee, la da da. Yeah. I can't <laughs> see in here. It's a, it's, a, it's a classic dance record. Um, and so, um, and then after that, people started coming to me, asking me to help them out. And um, I ended up taking a job at the Securities and Exchange Commission in D.C. I decided I didn't want to be in New York anymore. There was um, a lot going on. There was like a, a, a trash strike and a mm. blackout and all kinds of things. I couldn't keep my car there because it was just too expensive to park. And yeah. I decided I wanted to come back to D.C. Um, and so I came back to D.C. and... Um, worked at the Securities and Exchange Commission. And um, I met up with some other friends and colleagues of mine who went to Howard undergrad who were starting a record company. And I assisted them with starting the record company and we all ended up owning the record company together. And that record company ended up producing Drew Hill, Sitko and Maya actually is her name. Maya, and they're all out of the Baltimore um, well, the Maryland area, DC, Maryland area. Um, and so they, um, you know, I kept my job at the SEC until one day um, one of our acts, um, kind of their record blew up and money started coming in from every direction. And that's when I resigned my job and started working full time as in-house counsel for this record label that we started. and my skills and so in understanding recording contracts so recording contracts are equally as complicated as let's say underwriting documents for a public offering and the sad thing is that most artists don't have any level of sophistication to really understand what's going on in a recording contract and the things that i learned in working on wall street and otherwise about contracts in general i make this analogy when i teach as well that um a contract in many ways is like a word problem. Remember when you were in, you know, elementary school and you learned, you know, multiplication, subtraction, I mean, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and then you moved on to word problems, right? right? So contracts in many ways are like word problems. <laughs> you have to take them and break them back down to their mathematical equation to figure out if it's a good contract for you or not. Now, sure, there are other considerations that aren't related to the finances, but most of the time the finances are a pretty big part of a contract, right? right. And so understanding that, when I read the recording contract, two big things stuck out to me. And one was that the record company only pays the artist for 10 songs, typically the contract will say how many but typically 10 songs on an album. So if an artist has 13, 14, 15 songs on an album, all of that money for is being charged back against their royalty account. Hmm. And so they can end up in a situation where they produced an album that say has 19 or 20 songs on it, and they are basically gonna get no money. It's like an illusory contract. 
they'll never get any money. And so when I was reading the contracts, the, you know, because I'm thinking about it from a financial standpoint, I'm recognizing these things. I'm like, wait a minute, if they're deducting that against this, there's nothing left. What's, you know? And so I started approaching the, the record companies at that time, it was Polygram Universal Island and saying, hey, wait a minute, we're only giving you 10 songs. If you want more than 10 songs on this record, you're going to have to agree to pay for the rest of the songs because what typically happens is the artists go in creatively and make a bunch of music, right? Mm -hmm. Or and, and we were a production company, so we were responsible for administration of what was happening with their albums. Um, so in each song, obviously, gets an individual copyright. There's a copyright in the master recording, which is the rendition of the song, as well as what we call the underlying musical composition, which is the song itself, mm -hmm. right? So it's the song itself that the record company will only pay a certain amount of money for. Because uh, what most people don't realize is that there was a compromise between the music publishing business and the recorded music business. Most people don't even know that they're two different businesses, right? I mean, it's all about the music business, but within there, there's two very different businesses. The music publishing and business existed long before the recorded music business existed. The recorded music business comes around around 1900, around the turn of the century with the industrial coming into the industrial age. The printed music industry, which is sheet music, has been around for hundreds of years before yeah. that, equivalent to when Gutenberg invented the printing press. Not yeah. only were they printing Bibles and other books, but they were printing music, folio books, right? And the music industry, the music publishing industry developed. So there was a compromise between the music publishing industry and the recorded music industry, just like what's happening now with the digital industry, and, you know, the record companies, they're having to come to these compromises about royalties. So mm -hmm. there was a compromise made for something called a statutory license, which allowed any record company to commercially release a record as long as they paid a statutory royalty to the music publishing company. Mm -hmm. And we have the same thing repeating itself in history now with digital That's music. True. True. As music transitions with each new technology that comes in there's a whole new set of rules and guidelines that get put into place to protect music and allow creators and owners of music to collect royalties and out of all the copyrightable rights out of all the intellectual property rights that they are whether it's you know copyrights and we're talking about music the songs the masters artwork photography you know whatever it is um Oh, or we're talking about patents, or we're talking about um, trade secrets even, um, or trademarks. There's no other intellectual property other than music that has a systemized mechanism for royalty collection and distribution, right? Photographers don't, there's no system set up for photographers when someone uses their photography. They either get paid or they have to run after them to try to get their money. Not the case with music. With music, it's all set up automatically. Radio stations, TV stations, and this is like how all the media, so there's this convergence of, um, uh, of different legal principles and other principles, marketing and business principles from different industries, from the technology, um, mm -hmm. you know, from different places that are coming together. And music is uniquely situated where there's all these mechanisms that are systemically set up to pay royalties yeah. that don't exist for any other intellectual property type, right? And some of it is statutory. Uh, royalties that are, are compulsory royalties, and some of it is arm's length negotiation. And there's always a battle um, between different users of music and the owners of music as to whether or not it should be some type of a compulsory or statutory license where the copyright office sets the price or whether it's a um, you know arm's length transaction where the parties negotiate for whatever they think the best price is. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, so, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of different factors at stake in all of those negotiations, a lot of different interested parties. Um, so then maybe what, what are some of the, I mean, it sounds, sounds like there's many, but what are some of the biggest challenges you've faced 
I guess, mm -hmm. in your career generally, but maybe specifically kind of in your work in IP and entertainment law? Um, well, I think, um, so when I started out, so I started out in-house at a record label that I was a co-owner of a production company. The difference between a record label and a production company is that a production company doesn't actually try to market and distribute the music. They just make it and turn it over to a bigger distributor like a Universal or Warner Brothers, et cetera, versus an independent label. They're going to try to do their own distribution themselves. So we were a production company. We had deals with actually all the major record labels. Um, and one of the reasons why we did was because of my experience on Wall Street. So I set up each of our artists in their own single purpose corporation. And so when we did a deal with Universal, Interscope for one artist, for our label, they thought they were getting all of our artists, but they were only actually getting the artists that were in that single purpose corporation. Huh. And because I did that, we were able to get distribution deals with all the major distributors for different artists that we had signed to our company at the time. That's awesome. So my background from Wall Street obviously helped with that. It also helped me with figuring out the money to make sure that you know, we weren't delivering more intellectual property to the distributor than what they were actually agreeing to pay for in the agreement that we had with them, right? Right. Um, and then, and so, but that was a challenge because I was doing something that a lot of other lawyers weren't doing. And I got a lot of pushback um, from the different dis lawyers in the distribution companies and others. And, and I learned that the leverage in that is how bad they want your artist, right? Or how many records your artist is selling. So if your artist is doing real successful, you can get a lot out of them. Which when I started representing Missy Elliott, I was able to get lots and lots of good stuff for her because she was so successful and right. she had good contracts even before I got involved. So she essentially was a free agent. So we were in a position to really do some good things for her. Um, the challenge oftentimes is um, that, um, you know, and, and, and from the client standpoint is that a lot of times the client doesn't really appreciate or understand the significance of, you know, the negotiation and what things are important in the contract in order for them to have long term you know, earning potential from the contract as opposed to just that upfront check, kind of the pink catalog that is the you know, kind of the, the bad um, image about the industry that, you know, record label, label will give you a pink Cadillac and you'll never get your royalties, right? So it's about that. Uh, that really symbolizes the difference between that upfront check versus really having a good contract that ensures that you're going to earn money. Why? Because copyrights earn money for what? Life plus 70 yeah. years. So that's several generations of family members of yours who can make money from your creative works. And like I said, nowhere else but in music is everything all set up. All the mechanisms are set up to pay the royalties, yeah. right? Not true for fine artists. I'm now with these NT NFTs, um, they're saying that they have a mechanism for the artist to continue to get a royalty every time the artwork changes hands. And that's one of the important things about these NFTs that are becoming more and more popular. You're hearing them being talked about on CNBC and Yahoo News and Bloomberg and other places. But particularly in the creative industries, they're becoming you know, more significant. And they're offering now like to um, artists or for athletes that you can partner up with one of these companies that creates NFTs. They'll put you with an artist uh, who has had success selling NFTs, and then you'll both split the monies that are made from selling NFTs, right? So, you know, it all kind of keeps uh, progressing, but the NFT, uh, if we'll see how well it does and if it really works, but that is a very good thing for fine artists because it would allow them a way to continue to get paid as their, you know, works um, are change hands and sell for more and more money. We hear all these, this news about, you know, an auction at Sotheby's where some piece of art sold for $20 million. Well, the artist never gets any of that money, but with the NFT type of situation, they actually would. So that's, you know, 
and interesting. But but the, the challenges are, you know, kind of also having the client understand why it's important to focus on those things and not just the upfront money because there's gonna come a point in their career. Typically, um, you know, artists, creative people, even athletes, you know, they have the apex of their career and then they start going in the other direction. And if they've been wise about their contracts, they'll get a steady level of income from their intellectual property rights from their catalog that will continue to pay them for the rest of their life and pay their heirs for many, you know, many, many years to come. So um, it's important to, you know, make sure those things are understood and that they also even understand where the money is supposed to come from. Because if anyone who owns a corner store knows where the money is supposed to come from, right? But that's not the case for people in the music industry. They really don't, most people don't really understand how money is made in the music industry. So it's important for me to kind of educate my clients so that they have an understanding of that. Even if I'm not representing them, they at least know where they should be expecting their money to come from. Yeah. And it's certainly not in the record company's interest to like make them aware of all. The... No, it's not. And all of it doesn't even come from the record company, yeah. right? Some of it is the, the statutory royalties that are coming from the DSPs, the digital service providers, and from uh, streaming services or like Sirius XM and things like that. So, I mean, it's important just to know, right? right. Um, the record companies are notorious for not paying what they're supposed to pay. They have very understaffed accounting departments in general and audit departments. And it seems that their, their computer systems don't seem to be properly set up to catch every dollar that comes in to allocate it where it's supposed to go for some strange reason. That's fishy. <laughs> um, all right, well, kind of moving on. So what, um, what are the favorite parts of your job? What are the favorite parts of my job? Um, yeah. I think, um, well, it's always when, um, you know, you work on a project, you work on paperwork for a project where it's music, TV, or film, because I do a bit of all of it. And then, you know, you see it come to fruition and it's successful. Mm -hmm. That like, you know, is is something that is, you know, definitely um, fulfilling and, and makes, makes me feel good. Um, and obviously the clients feel good too. Um, but also training young, young people, I, I have, you know, been... Uh, uh, <clears throat> recruiting interns to work with me for many years now and um, to see them advance in their careers and get into different types of jobs. Um, one of my interns this summer, she got a position, um, Beyonce gave out a special, um, like a fellowship, I think it was, really? Um, really? to go and work in the jewelry industry. Oh, wow. And she won the fellowship and she's doing this special internship, this special fellowship, working in this, for this organization that deals with, um, you know, the jewelry industry. So that's like, you know, great. yeah. And um, some of my other, one of my other interns is now a general counsel at Uber, um, at Google. I mean, they're all over the place. So that's also very fulfilling. Yeah, awesome. Um, so yeah, kind of switching gears a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, mm -hmm. Where would you say we are at this moment in history, kind of with diversity and inclusion um, in the legal profession? And what would you say are some of the biggest obstacles uh, to mm -hmm. further prog progress mm -hmm. in that realm for underrepresented yeah. regions? Yeah, so I think, um, so I'll deal with two things. I'll deal with kind of um, private industry and, um, and government, and then the court system. Okay. okay, so in private industry and government, um, law firms, corporations, um, there, you know, still is a significant underrepresentation of people of color um, in those organizations. Um, and, you know, there's a natural tendency, I would say, and this is not anything scientific, this is just me, what I'm saying. Um, that people tend to hire and feel comfortable around people who look like them and are familiar to them. So you probably can understand it like if you were to say, okay, you're from New York and you're in uh, Italy and you run across someone else who's from New York. 
And suddenly you feel this kinship with them and you talk about all the familiar things that you know about New York and you make some connection to them. So that happens all the time in the, in the kind of in the hiring and employment process. And people tend to hire other people who are similar to them. So we have this real problem where it's not like someone is like, you know, thinking, oh, I'm not hiring any black people or I'm not hiring any Latinos or I'm not gonna hire LGTB, LGDP, D. I'm getting tongue twisted to him. <laughs> LGBT people, right? It's right. just that they tend to hire people that they feel comfortable with. So that's why there's a need to have a policy about hiring in diverse, making diverse hiring decisions mm -hmm. because of that, right? Because that's what we're working against. And I don't have the statistics with me, but you know they're readily available to see um, that most African-American attorneys and Latino attorneys in particular end up being hired by the government as opposed to private industry in corporate America when they do come out of law school. And that's where I think a big change needs to happen. Um, and then on the other side, on the court system side, because I'm also a litigator, um, I see a real, and I'm happy to see that the Biden-Harris administration is making a push to hire more diverse judges, uh, judges that come from, um, so most of the judges in the United States for in any way pre-Trump, because I don't know who Trump appointed. He appointed a bunch of people that a lot of them don't even have legal or litigation experience. Yeah. But traditionally, the, the judges would come from the ranks of the prosecutors. Almost probably 90% of all judges in the United States are former prosecutors. So that limits them. When I come in front of them with the copyright case, that limits them, right? right? right. It limits them significantly, especially in federal courts. Um, so I think that the, um, the diversity in the criminal justice system for judges in particular needs to come from, you know, different types of judges. And because, um, so many, unfortunately, African-American and Latino, um, defendants are before them, then when they often see my clients who look like hip hop people, they automatically are thinking of them as criminals as opposed to as business people, yeah. right? Yeah. And I've had these actual experiences um, in federal district court in New York, Southern District of New York and, and Florida. And other, you know, one client I had, I had to beg him to please take the gold teeth. You know, he, he was a rapper, he had gold. I Real? said, please yeah. you go into court. You got to take that out of your mouth. Because people, you know, make, you know, have opinions when they see things like that. Yeah. And for him, it was just going to be his, you know, style or whatever, representing who he was. But when you're going into court, in, in, even in a civil case, that doesn't give the right impression, right? But part of the reason why it doesn't give the right impression is because of stereotypes and, you know, profiling type issues yeah. that have come up. So more diversity among judges, but not just in terms of racial diversity, but in terms of their background, right? So more judges that are have done civil litigation, plaintiffs' attorneys, right? There's this big, you know, negative publicity always about plaintiffs' attorneys, and we always take a hit. I'm a plaintiffs' attorney, so we take a hit, you know, because of tort um, cases and you know, personal injury lawyers and people, uh, the perception that, and even trolling now in, in intellectual property, this whole concept of trolling. And now that everyone's talking about copyright trolling, well, someone might call me a copyright troll. But what I do is go to try to get money from my clients who have copyright interests who aren't getting their money. I'm not doing it just, you know, for no reason. So um, those are kind of the issues where I think we need to have change. We need more, we need significantly more hiring taking place, right? Um, and we need to encourage more young kids from disadvantaged neighborhoods of all races to go to law school, right? Um, or to be the first lawyer in their family, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's important because it gives you a different perspective on life. Um, once you're a lawyer, because in many ways, a legal education is like a, uh, um, 
liberal arts education, you know, all the classes that we have to take as lawyers, right? We've got to take, you know, contracts, property, constitutional law. You don't, you don't, a lot of people that have never been to law school don't realize that you don't major in anything when you go to law school. Like you'll have opportunities to take elective courses, but the fundamentals, we all have to learn the fundamentals, right? We specialize after we get out but we all learn the fundamentals, right? So I would like to see more um, judges that have diverse backgrounds, not only as criminal defense attorneys as opposed to prosecutors, but civil litigators, right? People who do intellectual property litigation. Uh, Justice Sonia Sotomayor actually was a trademark attorney and she worked for Fendi uh, before she made it to uh, being a judge. But she started out as a prosecutor. She was prosecuting um, counterfeiting stuff and she was very effective and that's why Fendi hired her to do their defense work for their um counterfeiting stuff so um you know I think it I think it's just important um to for that diversity to exist and that uplifts people in many ways it uplifts people in terms of their income potential it uplifts people in terms of their exposure it uplifts people in terms of their interaction with other people of different races and different backgrounds right which really at the end of the day in my opinion is what's going to solve the race problem that we have in the united states right because when i see um, you know, interracial couples, or I see people who grew up in diverse neighbor neighborhoods, they tend to have different opinions, right? And they're not so quick to judge people. One of, you know, one of the reasons why we have such a problem with the police and the Black community and Latino community is because of, you know, judgments that are made, right? Mm -hmm. That someone is dangerous just because of the way that they look without really appreciating if they're dangerous or not, right? Mm -hmm. Um, is this person, so, you know, for a, a cop or, you know, if you have more black friends, then it's easier for you to identify someone who's a threat from someone who isn't a threat. Right. Because of course there are some black people who are threatening. Yes. But obviously not all of us. Yeah. Right. Um, so, um, you know, those, those kinds of things need to happen in, in the, in the legal profession, I think we just, we need to get that um, cross pollinization of more lawyers of color working in corporate America and private industry law firms, instead of everyone kind of being cycled, the majority of people being cycled into government out of school. And one of the reasons why is because the government can't discriminate. There's other laws, there's other factors that come into play with the government, right? It doesn't, it doesn't account for individual biases or that terrible supervisor that you don't like, right? Um, but it gives opportunity. And that's really what I think we can ask for is opportunity. Right. Yeah. So would there is there any kind of specific thing you would say on that front in kind of the IP realm specifically? Or much well, I mean, let's talk about the entertainment space in particular. Yeah. Um, there is a lot, there is a very small uh, music bar, there's a very small film and TV bar. Um, and um, there definitely needs to be more diversity in terms of hiring, right? I mean, that's basically what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that's within the law firms and at the record companies and the studios and the other places. Um, and I mean, there are, I, I have friends, I'm on the board of the uh, um, Black Entertainment and Sports Lawyers Association, and we have uh, membership and board members that are at Netflix and Viacom and Disney and all the major um, companies, NBC, Universal, they're all there, but there just aren't enough, right? There just need to be more. Right. So, um, and, and that helps to generally uplift, you know, the community in general, which helps to, you know, alleviate violence and drug abuse and all of those other things that kind of trickle down from that. Um, and then, um, and also there's, I think, um, a need for um, there to be uh, more capital available for startup businesses, uh, particularly in the IP space that's directed towards people of color um, to help them get started. Very little venture capital money goes to, you know, these different 
uh, companies that want to start different, um, you know, uh, new technology businesses. Um, because all of this is fusing together, like entertainment is like the content that's fusing together with everything else, right? Yeah. Um, so it's all kind of getting mixed up together. When I talk to young people and they say they want to be an entertainment lawyer, I'm saying, well, okay, I, got, I, I understand you're saying that, but I think you'd be really happy if you were working at Uber, or I think you'd be happy if you were at Google. And they're like, yeah, I would. So, you know, just expand your concept of what it means, because at the end of the day, the content is going to be important for everyone, right? Yeah. Um, so there's all these other job opportunities now where we can get in, in terms of different social media, Facebook, Twitter, you know, Instagram, this one, that one, Clubhouse now, and these other new ones that are coming out. So, you know, trying to see a, a bit of diversity there is what's important. And, you know, Dave Chappelle said something um, in one of his comedic acts at the end of one of his acts about, um, you know, diversity, I thought was very important. And he said, you know, the thing to do is like a lot of people there, this question comes up, well, are these people qualified? Are we just hiring because them because they're black, you know, or are they really qualified? And so he said, you know what, um, if you really want to do something about, you know, diversity, hire the person that you think doesn't deserve the job. How about that? Right? <laughs> because most likely, that black person that got hit in the head didn't deserve to get hit in the head either. So let's just do, let's have some equality here. So hire the person that you think doesn't deserve the job and see how they do. Yeah. That's so that that was interesting. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so kind of shifting to talk on mentors. Um, mm -hmm. You touched on this a little bit, both in mentoring and yeah. a specific mm -hmm. mentor. So maybe... You can start back um, with the first firm that you worked at. Um, you mm -hmm. spoke out of one, but have you had any mentors that have impacted your career? And if so, who are they? Mm -hmm. um, so I would say um, Donald Temple, a local lawyer in DC, was very helpful to me as a mentor. Not so much in intellectual property, just in developing my own practice and running my own practice. Um, he definitely was a mentor and has been a big help and um, along the way. Um, obviously, I mentioned Jim Marcelino when I was first getting out of school. Um, there was a program called PALS in New York that when I went to work at Sherman and Sterling that paired up junior associates with um, more senior level associates and partners at big firms in New York. And that organization was very... Um, um, instrumental too. I was involved in that and that was helpful, you know, just to kind of ask questions and find out, you know, how late should I stay to work? Should I go early? Like, you know, what do I do? And, and now translating that, um, I do a mentor, a number, you know, of different young attorneys. Um, and one of the things I'm finding out about, I guess they're the millennials is the expectation Expectation is in an internship that it's for them. Hmm. And that's the wrong expectation. The internship is not for you. The internship is to get whatever the project or whatever the job is for the organization that you're working for done. Right. And you're learning in that process, but it's not actually about you, right? So if you go to work one day and you don't have anything to do, don't complain, right? The work is likely to come, right? Right. <laughs> well, they didn't give me anything to do today. What am I learning today? I just want to know about this. I wanted this. So I have to sometimes reprogram them to understand, no, that's not what you're there for. And there were many days when I worked in law firms when I had nothing to do. And then there were other days, I tell there's going to be other days when you got to work 24 hours. Yeah. So when you get those days where it's slow, Get on, do play a game on your computer, read a book, do whatever on YouTube. Don't worry about Enjoy it because as a lawyer, the work is coming. One thing we definitely do as lawyers is work. Yeah. We work, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, uh, and then um, other than that, I mean, there have been a lot of other lawyers, you know, along the way that I've, you know, 
contacted and and had uh, communications with and for career advice and 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 uh, for help for, for mentoring generally. Um, and it's an, it's definitely something that's important to happen. I think Jim Marcelino was really a big mentor to me and taught me a lot um, during the summer that I did at, at Gaston Snow and also the year that I worked there, just under a year. Um, that was a tremendous thing. And had I realized at that time how important having a mentor was, even though New York was offering me double the money, I might have stayed there because of the benefit of having the mentor, right? Because in the end, it would have all evened out in the end anyway, right? Right. Uh, But I just didn't know that at the time. Um, So it's important if you do have a mentor in a work environment, it's important to understand, you know, the value of that. And, um, And there certainly will be a natural time when it's time for that relationship to kind of sever and you, you to move on to something else. Um, I think I did it in hindsight. I think I did it a little prematurely. Um, um, And one of the other interesting things that happened is that when I graduated from law school, I also got um, an offer from a small firm in New York on Wall Street called Lewis and Clarkson. And Lewis and Clarkson offered me a job and the partner was Reginald Lewis, who um, ended up shortly thereafter doing the biggest um, uh, what do they call it? Hostile takeover, the RJR Nabisco hostile wow. takeover. And I didn't realize it because they were a small firm. I thought that I was doing the better thing by going with the big firm. Right. Yay. And some of the work for that RJR Nabisco takeover ended up on my desk when I was at Sherman and Sterling <laughs> for one of the underwriters in the project. And I could have been on the other side getting probably a cut of the whole deal if I had stayed at that small firm. So you just never know where life is going to take you, right? right? So what can you say? (laughs) I think it all worked out for you in the end. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Um, So this is kind of an interesting one. Um, If you could have lunch with any lawyer alive or dead, who would it be? Third Marshall. Very good. Third Marshall. Yeah. One of the things that I see missing um, in the current climate is there aren't any class action civil rights lawsuits being filed. There's no strategic filing of lawsuits that's happening to supplement um, the legislation that's being proposed. Um, and the demonstrators. And that's the difference between today and back in the 60s when the civil rights movement was happening. Nobody is doing what kind of Thurgood Marshall and other lawyers of his ilk were doing at that time, which was strategically figuring out how and where to file lawsuits, even in light of a very, very, very conservative court, right? Including a conservative Supreme Court right? Um, I don't know if you watched the movie. Did you see the movie about his life, Thurgood Marshall? I don't think Well, it's not really about his life. It's about one case that he had representing a Black man who was falsely accused of raping a white woman. It was kind of a famous celebrated case. And he was the defense attorney for this lawyer before he really got off into filing the, um, the discrimination cases for the schools and all of that. And it's a story about that case. And um, he's working for, I think, the NAACP. And they would send him out to represent people who were African-Americans who were falsely accused of crimes. A lot of times it was raping white women that was falsely accused. And he had to prove that this man uh, did not um, rape this, uh, the the woman, the, the white woman who was, a society, she was the head of, in the head of society, her husband had a high place in society and she was a society woman. And what actually happened is that they were having an affair Mm -hmm. and she thought she was pregnant and that her husband was gonna find out about it. So she had to tell her husband that she was raped in order to get around it. 
and he was going to go to prison for the rest of his life yeah. for raping her. And so Thurgood Marshall had to figure out in a Southern court, like this is like in Mississippi or Alabama with a Southern judge who was very anti-Black and a whole anti-Black situation, how to win that case. And he won. And, and if it's a good, it's a good movie to watch just for you as a lawyer, yeah. right? What, want to be a litigator or not to see how he did it right and when I watched the impeachment trial um the first time around yeah what was missing is that see African-American lawyers have had to know for a very long time how do you deal with a jury that you know is against you how do you deal with judges that you know walking in the door are against you before you even get in the door, who are even restricting what you get to do in the courtroom? Like they restricted Thurgood Marshall. The judge at one point told him he couldn't talk anymore in the courtroom, right? Just out of racism, no other, there was no legitimate reason to tell him that. But he figured out what to do. And that's what I didn't see, right, in that impeachment trial. And that's what I don't see happening for the Democrats, how you convince people who you know don't believe in what you believe and believe something totally different, how you convince them to see the truth and to see the right way, right? And he does it in that movie. And it's a very interesting uh, way that he does it. So it's a good, it's a good movie to watch. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah. So I think, you know, um, Thurgood Marshall is certainly the person that I would like to meet. No, that, yeah, that was awesome. Um, do you have any advice? And or Charles Hamilton Houston, who is okay. no longer here. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just to throw it in there. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you have any advice uh, for law students or young attorneys of color uh, interested in pursuing IP or entertainment law? Um, well, I think the thing is really to get the expertise. That's the most important thing. And then to try to get um, internships um, and to associate yourself, join organizations. If you've just, if you've just graduated from law school, join the intellectual property um, section of your bar association, your state bar association um, of the ABA bar association and, you know, things like, you know, attend things like IPSA. It's, a, it's about networking and getting around the people who can, you know, be helpful to you and don't be discouraged. And this is for all attorneys, not just, you know, um, attorneys of color, but all attorneys. Don't be discouraged if when you get out of school, you don't get the job in the industry that you want to work in. It's a process, right? Most entertainment lawyers that I know did not, any IP lawyers did not start out doing IP. They started out doing something else, right? So you, and, and you take the job, you take the best job that you're offered. You don't, you don't choose a city that you want to live in when you're coming out of school. You go to the city where you get a job. That's the first thing when you're first out of school. Mm -hmm. After you have a job and you work there for a while and you decide you want to work in a city, another city, you start looking for a job in that other city, right? Or that's your long-term, long-term is that I want to live in Florida. Long-term is that I want to live in LA. Long-term is that I want to live in New York. It doesn't have to happen right out of school, right? right. So, and let's say you, you got a choice. So you got a choice working for a firm that does real estate, commercial real estate. You want to do IP, but this is what you got. You got commercial real estate. You got to offer to go to the prosecutor's office or to be a public defender, let's say, and you got an offer to go to the FDA. What do you do, right? Well, if you want to be a patent lawyer and that's your goal, the FDA might be the best choice. Right. If you want to do other stuff, other trademark or whatever, probably go into commercial real estate because there are a lot of similarities in law and licensing and other things that happen in the context of real estate that are absolutely applicable in intellectual property. It's just another type of property. Right. So, you know, you just make the best decision at that time for where you are. And then you continue to direct yourself and direct your career in the way that you want to go right? You don't get upset because you didn't get a job at, you know, Google when you graduated from school and 
one of your classmates did. There are a few of them. And always remember that in-house corporate jobs are the most scarce jobs you can get, right? And for two reasons. One reason is because a lot of people don't leave those jobs once they get them. And they hide, they tend to hire from within, right? Law firm, big law firms are like a pyramid. So they'll hire a lot of people in that first class, but then they start getting rid of people. Second class, people go. Next class. And a lot of those people that work at the big, that get jobs, like come out of law school with the highest grades and get the jobs at the big law firms, right? And that's where they go. And then, but because of the way big law firms are, they start letting people go. After the first year, if the second class is smaller, the third class is smaller, the first, that's because of the pyramidal structure of the partnership and how they divide profits. So a lot of times those people end up going back to government jobs or lesser paying jobs after working at the big law firms because there aren't a lot of those same caliber jobs that you can apply for. They tend to pay more than in-house counsel jobs, right? Um, in-house counsel jobs um, pay a little less than big law firm jobs, pay really more like mid-sized law firm jobs, but then they might have stock options. Right. So, you know, you just kind of make your make your decisions. But um, so that's a place to get to an in-house, you know, an in-house corporate job, which is a good, excellent, you know, thing to do for sure. Right. And then a lot of people do teaching at the end of their career. And one thing that a lot of I think law students don't know about teaching is that you really need to have a clerkship if you want to teach at some point in time. If you're thinking that you want to ultimately teach, then you really need to do a clerkship while you're in school or right out of school, at least for a year, because most uh, law schools want you to have a clerkship and they certainly want you to have a publication, but most of them also want you to have done a clerkship. I didn't realize that. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, is there any anything you learned throughout your career that you would have liked to known in law school, like while you were in law school? Probably what I just told you, which is that you know where you're going to end up is not where you start. Like and um, and you know training. So the way I looked at going to work at those big Wall Street law firms is kind of like um, in comparison to, let's say, medical school. So medical students, there is a um, there is a, um, a whole system in place for them when they um, when they get out of school to go into their residencies, right, that we don't get as lawyers, like no one actually teaches us how to be a lawyer. Yes. They actually learn how to be doctors in their residency programs before they're let loose on the world as doctors, right? That doesn't happen with us. So I think it's um, kind of just an appreciation for um, the process of, um, you know, going through those early years of, of being a lawyer and making decisions about, you know, what you're going to do. And if I had to do it again, I probably would have uh, stayed as an in-house counsel mm. for a corporation. Interesting. Yeah, no, I think it's really valuable. I mean, especially like looking back at your career, kind of some of the things you learned early on when you were kind of figuring it out ended up making you a better attorney at mm -hmm. the other things you did. So exactly, that, that exactly. flexibility seems really important. Yeah. And, and, you know, for, for lawyers who focus on contracts, regardless of what industry you're in. So when I was at Sherman, at Gaston Snow and Sherman and Sterling, so I worked on a public offering for a, a um, swimming pool, um, you know, installation company, the biggest swimming pool company in the world, right? So I had to learn about the swimming pool industry. I did uh, the Pennzoil um, bond offering. So I had to learn about the oil and gas business. I had to interact with accountants and learn how to read financial statements. Um, and so what you learn is that um, you become kind of in those corporate firms, you become kind of an expert in the industry that you have to work on a project for, right? right. For that time period, you learn a whole lot about what that industry is all about. Um, so, um, you know, I worked, I did deals for actually a, the corporation that wanted to hire me when I left Sherman and Sterling. 
um, was um, a um, uh, consumer products manufacturing company that I think was later merged into Johnson and Johnson. Okay. I believe right. is who they merged into, but it was a big company that made chiclets and like Tide and all that kind of stuff. But I couldn't see myself working there at that time when I was young. And what, if I were making that decision today, I would make a different decision. I would have taken that position. They wanted me to do international acquisitions in the Iberian Peninsula in Europe and in South America. Hmm. But I couldn't see myself there in that corporate environment. Their offices were in New Jersey. Morris Plains, New Jersey. And I was thinking about it, about my social, like I made the decision for all the wrong reasons of why I didn't choose that job. <laughs> and looking back on it now, I'm like, what was I thinking about? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. So, you know, you just never know. Yeah. All right, so just got some fun questions for you left. Okay, um, okay. What is, or sorry, who's your favorite musical artist, would you say, alive or dead? Um, just kind of like uh, all time yeah. you kind of go back to. I would probably say Bob Marley. Excellent, excellent choice. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any particular favorite like up and coming artists? Particular favorite up and coming artist, hmm. That's a hard one. Even though I'm a music lawyer, I really can't <laughs> listen to a lot of that music. I'm definitely, it, my ears don't uh, adjust very well. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I love, the era of music that I love is the funk era, funk okay. music. Um, I'm settling a case for Cameo now and their iconic song, Candy. Like that's my, that's kind of where I fit in. I don't know a lot about current hip hop. All music right, there. or other pop music. <laughs> Fair. I mean, I there's a lot of it that I like. Um, and, you know, typically at the Grammys, I hear music from a bunch of new artists that I hadn't heard. And I, oh yeah, I like this one. I like that one. I like the other one. Uh, to give you their names off the top of my head, I probably could tell you. Okay, awesome. Um, and then do you have any hobbies kind of outside of your career that interest you? Or maybe, sure. Yeah. No, I I like antiquing and and collecting things, oh. different things. So I have a bunch of different collections, um, and I that um, I like doing that, and I like um, interior design. Nice. Awesome. All right. Well, that um, that wraps it up for me. Um, okay. Yeah. We again would just like to thank you for your time. Um, sure. and just sharing your experiences with us. Sure. Uh, yeah, and have a great rest of your day and um, look yeah. forward to following the rest of your career. All righty, great. Awesome. Thanks, Cole. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you.